along with me on a journey as we investigate a really challenging text and ask ourselves what God might still have to say through this text some 2,000 years later. So what I want to do is I want to open up in a word of prayer this morning, uh, and then I want to jump into to what we're actually going to be talking about, and I'll read the text, so let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, you're, you're God, you're good, and uh, you had a word for Paul some 2,000 years ago to write to the church in Corinth, um, and, and we get to investigate that word today, Lord, what appears to be a message about um, haircuts and hats and the nature of being a man and a woman, um, I think that wasn't a mistake. It was something that you still want to speak to today. So Lord, I pray that you'll open up our eyes and open up our hearts to be able to receive uh, your word and the message that you still have for us today. Um, so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, usually we have a, a reader come up and read the text each week, but um, I just figured in the nature of this text, I'll go ahead and take that one. So we're going to be reading in um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 14. Uh, go ahead and read on the, the screen here. It says, Now I praise you because you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and the man, and that, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. Every man who prays or prophesies with something on his head dishonors his own head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since that is the one and the same, since that is one and the same as having her head shaved. So if a woman's head is not covered, her hair should be cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, she should be covered. A man, in fact, should not cover his head because he is God's image and glory, but woman is man's glory. For man did not come from woman, but woman came from man, and man was not created for woman, but woman for man. This is why a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. However, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, and man is not independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes through woman, and all things come from God. Judge for yourselves. It is, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? <laughs> but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For her hair is given to her as a covering. But if anyone wants to argue about this, we have no other custom, nor do the churches of God. All right. So what's that about? What's uh, what's what's the deal? Why why is that even in there? Why does God care about haircuts and hats? Um, uh, I feel like we sort of read it and sort of get like that the old I don't know the picture of um, I don't know you walk into a church service and you're wearing a hat, and there's somebody in the back being like, show some respect, take your, your hat off, right? I feel like, at least for me, um, I kind of grew up with a little bit of that experience, and I feel like I read a text like this, and I'm like, that seems a little bit arbitrary, right? Like, God, why should you care about something that doesn't seem to actually matter? And so what we need to re realize is that when we read a text like this today, it's, it, it's the context matters, right? The, what somebody says to me in a specific setting about the way I dress or act is, is contextual to our culture, to the way we experience certain types of dress or, or behavior, etc. Right? And so um, our job today is to look at the claims that Paul's making in this difficult test, text and examine what they meant in the context of first century Corinth, right? And, and because of that, once we can identify sort of the core um, issues that Paul is wrestling with through haircuts and head coverings, then maybe we can find what actually should still apply to us today. So um, the first one, first, first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to just start at beginning uh, back at verse 2 and just uh, start, start, start right with the, the foundation that he lays at the beginning of the section. He says, now I praise you because you remember me in all things keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. So what Paul begins 
uh, by doing here is establishing that the church in Corinth had actually, by and large, been very faithful to the teachings that Paul had given them. Even though we've been reading through a book about all the questions and the issues that have arisen, what we found out from the book of, of Corinthians is that's actually a pretty normal thing for a church to do. At, at any given time, uh, so what we're not talking about here is a church in total rebellion. What we're talking about is a church that, like any church, comes up against the cultural questions of their day, and as they feel it creeping into their communities and questions arise, they, they sort of end up asking the question, well, okay, what about this? What do, I, what do I do about this? What's okay? What's not okay? How far should I go with this or, or, or that, right? Um, and so uh, in verse 4 and 5, um, in verse 4 and 5, Paul jumps into, I, I'm going to skip a couple verses for now, and I'm going to look at the examples that he gives, and then I'm going to come back to the reason that he, he gives them. Okay, so, uh, so once again, for some reason or another, the Corinthians have come up against this issue that for some reason head coverings, uh, or haircuts, depends on how you want to interpret the whole covering thing, um, seems to speak to this particular culture in a particular way. And so when we look at verses 4 and 5, we find that uh, Paul starts to speak to men, uh, every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered, or so something on his head dishonors his head, and you say, well, that doesn't... What's that all about? That doesn't seem to make sense. Um, there's this, uh, if, if any of you guys aren't familiar with this organization called the Gospel Coalition, they're, they're online, um, really good resource if you're ever curious about just searching for specific uh, uh, issues or topics or what do we do with this text or whatever. Uh, I, I, I often go to the Gospel Coalition and type in and read articles um, by, the, by the scholars that they, that they, um, that they receive uh, or, or participants from, writers from. And there's a guy named Dr. Richard Pratt, and he said, he said this about this specific text. He said, in the Roman Empire, men generally covered their heads with their togas as they performed pagan worship rituals. It's not known for certain that this practice had reached Corinthian pagan worship, but it seems likely that Paul at least war, uh, warned against adopting this practice in the church. In a word, for a man to cover his head in the worship of Christ was to worship in the same way pagan men worship their gods. Imitating this practice mixed false religion into the worship of Christ and therefore dishonored him. Or dishonored him, yeah. So, and he also points out that it's important to remember that um, Paul is not necessarily, so what Paul's doing is he's taking a very contextual thing and he's saying, hey, uh, you guys understand that the way that you see worship happening generally by men in, within your culture is to have this very specific experience of, of head covering. Right? And, and I want you to know that that's actually, you're not bound by that. Right? I don't want you to be adopting practices just because they seem spiritual. I want you to be thinking about what's actually happening in worship, and you covering your head is not primarily part of that. And if that's going to be confusing to you, I don't want you to cover your heads at all. Because right? that's going to take away from your actual worship of Christ if you're putting too much uh, emphasis in the, uh, the, in the, the sort of the arbitrary details. And, and this, we also know that this is true uh, by a large other places. When God, Yahweh God, comes down and he's talking with the people of Israel, he establishes the, the temple, uh, the, the, the first temple, and before that, um, when they're on the wilderness still, uh, he says, he goes to Aaron, the, uh, the tabernacle, sorry. He goes to Aaron, who's the high priest at the time, and he says, hey, anytime you come before me, I want you to wear this turban thing, right? Now, we can talk about why God had him do that, too. But the point is, in this situation, in that situation, God had Aaron wear a turban. In this situation, Paul's saying, no, 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 don't, don't wear that, don't wear that, the hat, the, the covering, right? So the, the principle we need to walk away with is that neither one seems to actually be saying, the head covering, that's really what matters. No, he's saying, what's going on in your experience of worship, that's what really matters. And we are cultural people. We are influenced by the culture we live in. And it's okay to acknowledge that and also to take precautions against that when it's confusing to us or when it might cause us to, to not be fully engaged in worship, right? And so Paul's responding to a particular pagan influence that come to, to, to Corinth and, and um, not necessarily giving absolutes. Uh, for women then, in, in the following verses, Pratt goes on, he says a couple other things. I'm going to come back to the specific verses here in a second, but... Um, something we should know is that women throughout Scripture, one thing that we get in trouble sometimes is, is you look at a specific text, 
And you say, uh, and that becomes sort of the thing that you paste on the poster or put in the Facebook post or whatever, and it just be like, wow, you know, patriarchal jerks, the Bible hates women. And that's just like not true. So you can sometimes like take a, a little, a quick, a quick snapshot of some of these verses and say, this just seems weird. God doesn't seem to like women. women and yeah, it does seem weird. I'll we'll give you that, right? right? It does seem weird. Because once again, when we just take this verse alone, we don't see a very necessarily high view of women. But throughout Scripture, including the New Testament, women are regularly involved in the worship service. They're praying, they're prophesying, they're evangelizing, they're being part of the community of believers in all other spheres of influence, right? And so uh, while, while Paul does forbid women in a couple of texts, to, to, to participate in very specific roles, that of pastor and elder and teacher, according to the book of First Timothy, they're not restricted from being Christians and living out their faith actively as part of a gospel-centered, even uh, like uh, community that wants that is evangelical in nature, right? Wants to share the gospel with others. And Paul expects women to be involved in, in the worship, right? Nonetheless, he, he insists that people, uh, or that these women, while they can pray and prophesy um, in public, should do so with their head covered. So once again, if they're already part of worship service, if, if that doesn't seem to be the problem, he seems to be the problem. The problem being that they're doing it without their head covered. So what does that mean for us? What, what's, his, what's his deal there? And now, I think it's probably worth acknowledging, sometimes we don't have all the details, right? Like, this is a letter... Uh, Paul, Paul received a letter from the Corinthians that says, hey, we have all these questions about this. And then Paul writes a response. And so sometimes we have the answers, but we don't have the specific question, right? And so we sort of have to sift through the details a little bit of what he's actually getting at. And so what it seems like is, is while well, we don't understand exactly why it was the situation the way it was, but that there was something about women, women having their heads uncovered. And I heard people talk about this as associated with maybe prostitution or, or with, uh, you know, sort of ritualistic pagan temple worship for women or whatever. And once again, so it's sort of the opposite of the, the male situation. Um, I think it's also indicative that in, in the verse here, it says, uh, verse 5 says, since that is one and the same thing, having her head covered is one and the same as having her head shaved. So why would she just shave her head? There was this Near Eastern culture. Uh, practice of women who were caught in adultery who would have their heads shaved, right? And he's saying, which of course, why is he doing this? Because it will bring dishonor to the head, which he points out is her husband earlier. Just hold on with me, we'll get there, all right? Um, but once again, so of course, if you're caught in adultery, that's going to bring dishonor to your husband, right? So once again, for some reason, head covered, head not covered, dishonor, struggles in our experience of worship. We don't have all the details, but the, 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 the principle seems to be that we should be participating in, in public worship in a way that expresses our worship for Christ most, most holistically and differentiates ourselves if it could be confused with worship of, or let's say, if it could be confused with prostitution if you could be confused with worship of other gods from other religions, right? He's saying, the way you present yourself in your worship matters, okay? It doesn't mean you have to show up at church on, on Sunday in a suit. Clearly, I don't feel that way, but, but it does say something about the culture that you're in and, and that matters. So, so why all this talk about haircuts and, and stuff, right? What, what, what's Paul's getting at? In verse 3, he, he lays the foundation, okay? In verse 3, he says, But I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and that man, the man is the head of every woman, and God is the head of Christ. And he reinforces these in verses 7 through 10. Um, in verses 7 through 10, he kind of goes back to Genesis, and he says, A man, in fact, should not cover his head, because he is God's image and glory. But woman is the glory of man, for man did not come from woman, but woman came from man, and man was not created for woman, but woman for man. This is why women should have a symbol of authority on their head, because of the angels. Also, the because of the angels thing, I don't really have time to talk about. Nobody actually super knows what that means. There's just theories, but it's also like, yeah, that was weird. Yeah, yeah, it's just really, yeah, it was really weird. Um, there's some theories about why he said that, but it's, 
not super important for us today. So, um, so what we should understand here is that what Paul seems to be arguing in 7 through 10 and in verse 3 is that there's something about this idea of headship, right? The word in Greek is, is kephale, right? This, the, and, and the word kephale has a couple of different applications. So how it's applied will obviously matter, right? Because we hear head one way, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's, that's the way it should be applied. Um, the, the two ways that it's generally applied are, are first is as sort of the source, like, um, like, the, like the source of a river, the head of a river, right? The beginning of the river, right? So, so what comes after it is, is, is more a question of um, time, right? So God came first, then man came, then woman came, and this is just sort of a very natural application. Okay, yeah, I guess, I guess that makes sense. God was the source of man, and then Eve was taken out of Adam's side, so, so he's the source there. Maybe, maybe that's what God's getting at. And it's true, there actually is this application. It's used this way throughout, um, throughout, the, throughout the New Testament, throughout the Old Testament. Um, but the problem is that there's a second application, and this is the one we're way less comfortable with, and that is that question of authority. And, and yeah, I'll, I'll get back. Um, <laughs> and this, this is this, this idea that this chain of authority extends from, from God the Father to Christ to husbands and to their wives. And of course, this makes us incredibly uncomfortable. Um, and while Paul does actually seem to use this language elsewhere in, in Scripture, um, Ephesians, he uses it in, um, I think Colossians, he uses a couple different places, but this idea of, of head meaning an authority over, over, another, over another person. Um, but here's the thing, I think both applications, at least according to this scripture, I think both applications could be correct, right? You could actually apply them both and have it be, um, and have it be what Paul means here. Um, so, once again, so now we're kind of coming full circle here. So now we've got this background, we've got this culture, we've sort of got a general principle, but what does it mean for us? What do we do with weird text um, on the screen today? What do we do with it? Um, one thing I want to say right from the beginning here, just so, so that it's understood. When we read a text like this, we have questions. Is it, does this mean that God gets to kind of boss us around and that also men get to boss women around? Like, is that... Is that the implication? Or does it mean that somehow like men are inherently like better or more capable or more intelligent or more qualified to lead than women? Because I think that's the way we hear it a lot. I think that's the way our, our natural inclination as we sort of uh, like fight against what we won't seem, at least historically, to be like an abusive patriarchal system. To go, man, no, like that's that's not fair, that's not right, like men aren't more, more qualified, more intelligent, more capable, and, and like I'm here to tell you, you're right. Like we're, we're not. We're not. Uh, I, yeah. That's it. <laughs> end, end, of, end of story. We're not. Um, but I also don't think scripture ever makes that claim. I think that's where we get in trouble, is that we assume because God says there's rules in relationship that God also says some people are better than others. And that's not true. We say that about people. We see rules in relationships and say some people are better than others. But God's word never actually says that. So here's what I mean. In Genesis, and you guys, I know I, I, know I say this stuff a lot, but I think it's important. In Genesis, we're told that men and women are made in the image of equally made in the image of God. And God is a relationship. God's a Trinitarian being. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit having this ongoing, intimate, personal relationship, right? And that we're told in Scripture that neither the Father nor the Son nor the Holy Spirit, like, nobody's less God. They're all fully God, fully divine. Their nature is fully powerful, fully omniscient, fully capable in all of their godness, right? Yet, yeah. while Jesus can say, if you've seen the, me, you've seen the Father. He says, the Father and I are one, right? And, and people pick up stones to, to stone him because he claimed to be God, right? Yet, Jesus also says, I speak the words of him, the Father, who sent me. 
I came to give his message. While Jesus was in the garden to be crucified, he said, not my will, but your will be done. And so we find while there's equity in nature within the Trinity, there's deference to love. These three persons of the triune God are, are voluntarily submitting to one another, loving one another, giving themselves up for and to one another. The Father sent the Son into the world and not the other way around. The Holy Spirit is sent by Jesus and proceeds from the Father to testify about Christ. And Jesus perfectly submitted to the Father's will. Each character, each, each person of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, each had their own tasks that would result from this love relationship. And I think the way that Paul talks about it here, using this imagery from Genesis in verses 7 through 12, he's basically saying it's not that different for men and women. Is there headship within this equality and love? Yeah. It's the way God set it up. It's the way he experiences it, right? And that's the way he gives us to live it out. And, and the truth is, we're all under authority, right? Like, oh, I'm under the elders of the church, we're all under the government, local and otherwise. We all, and we as Christians are all under Christ. I think, I think one thing that I think is probably worth talking about here is um, when we talk about headship, once again, this is scary, and I'm, I want to give us a, a I know I know I'm, um, kind of screaming out the sound a little bit, but I think it's important, and I think it's not a message we get very often. You guys heard of uh, sort of the difference between egalitarian and complementarianism? You guys heard the, who's heard those terms before? A few people, all right, a few people. All right, this is the difference, right? Egalitarianism and complementarianism are kind of the two common ways that we approach the idea of male-female relationships, at least in our culture today, okay? Um, Complementarian, this, this, and I'm going to be using sort of extremes, right? But egalitarian generally is a desire to do away with male headship uh, in the pursuit of total equality, right? And this is this is real. Right? This is a response to abusive patriarchy where where women have been treated as second class citizens. They haven't been valued or educated or raised to feel valued and respected, right? And yet we at Rock of Ages, right? If you're a Christian. I think God's word teaches them that the women aren't just like a second, they aren't like an afterthought. They aren't like a, a cool, like, you know, somebody just to hang out with men so they can feel good, right? Like, they are an indispensable part of God's kingdom and the way that he wants to save the world. Absolutely indispensable, right? Yet, at an extreme, gender becomes purely a construct, right? That, that men and women are so alike that their biological makeup ceases to have any identity value, right? We lose the capacity to identify anything beautiful and special about being specifically male and specifically female. And somewhere in there, we lose part of the beauty God had for us. Where he said, I made you man. That's pretty cool. I made you woman. That's pretty cool. You know? And, and we get to revel in this coolness that God's given us that's specific to us. And then there's complementarianism, okay? It's, it sees women, men and women as the same in dignity and worth, and yet given specificity and human uh, flourishing, both in work and at home, right? But And it's extreme. There are there are times where something that says the complementary view, man is, man is, well, we'll kind of argue that man is the leader and woman follows behind, and, and this has been abused to the point where, you know, I, I was reading, I was, I was listening to a sermon this week, and the guy was talking about how, how the pastor had come into contact with one couple where the guy was so gun ho about his own headship and leadership that he expected the woman in his house, his wife, to ask to go use the bathroom, right? To go from one room to the next, she needed to ask permission because he was the man. And the pastors had to be like, you're an idiot. What's wrong with you? How do you, outside of hearing the word headship, how do you possibly get that from Scripture, that that's how you should treat your wife? Stop it. Quit being a dummy. All right? So regardless of whatever title you want to put on it, here's it, whether it's egalitarian or complementarianism, complementarianism, here's the truth. Here's what I think Scripture actually says, right? Humanity wasn't at its best until both men and women were on the scene. There wasn't human flourishing 
until both men and women are on the scene. God didn't give his mandate just to, 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 to go forth and produce and, and, and rule the world in God's name. He didn't give that just to men or just to women. He gave it to both. The same is true in the New Testament. When, Matthew, when Jesus goes and he says, hey, I want you to go and baptize. I want you to make disciples in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit. That wasn't just to men that he gave that, the Great Commission. He gave it to all of his disciples, which included women, right? There isn't a gender specification in the mission of the church, right? And we know that women are, are capable. We see this all over the place. Women, uh, of course, the famous example is Deborah in the Old Testament, who basically functioned as the political leader of Israel for a time. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and her and her her holiness and her faithfulness. Anna, the prophetess, who prophesied over baby Jesus in the temple, and also the many women who walked with Jesus as part of his ministry, right? Where, where the people of Jesus' day would not teach women, Jesus taught women. Where people, where women couldn't normally follow after a rabbi, he let women follow after a rabbi. The women, the women that were changed by his ministry brought that same message of change to others, right? Women were the one who came upon his empty tomb and were the one who delivered that message to the disciples, even though their testimony wouldn't have been valid in court. In the book of Titus, older women are teaching younger women. Phoebe, this patron and deacon of the church, is commended by Paul and was likely the courier of Paul's epistle to the Romans across, across the Mediterranean. There are other women who labored side by side with Paul. So even for Paul, he's not saying that these women don't work with him. He has tons of women who worked right alongside with him in ministry. And there's no doubt that women play a role in the leadership of the church, both as, as and in the greater community. Yet there's also these verses that I mentioned before in Timothy where, where Paul seems to make it, in terms of specific, specific leadership, very male-oriented. So how can the Bible hold to total equality between the sexes? and still designate roles that seem to give one sex power over another. Um, you guys ever heard that word, this, I, and I'm, I'm wrapping up here soon, but you guys heard the word um, submission, right? If we've heard the word submission, nobody likes that, right? Kind of, kind of, I think, I think for us in our day, it sort of, it sort of brings up the feeling of, I don't know, like transatlantic slave trade, total dominance, power, one person, hurting other people for the sake of, of, of their own authority. Um, there's a guy named John Piper, and he talks about how when we look at issues of headship or submission in the New Testament, and we hear words like that, we fear for the safety of women. Because we know how things can be abused and have been abused. But he says a few things, and I think it's probably worth it us paying attention today. What submission and headship aren't. Okay? What they aren't. The first thing it is, headship and submission are not agreeing with everything a man says. Okay? Both husbands and wives are subject to Christ first. So there's a wife who says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let my husband be the head of the home. She still is subject to Christ first. And if your husband's a dummy and says, hey, let's disobey God's rules, she's going to go, no. I'm not going to submit to you. Because you're being a dummy. And my submission is to Christ first, right? If it's an issue of doctrine that, that, that they disagree on, then they're called to go to Scripture together, to investigate together, to learn together, to wrestle with the Scriptures together, right? So, and that leads to our second one, which is submission and headship does not mean leaving your brain behind, right? Male headship is not a case of men being more intellectually capable. Men and women both need to be seeing each other uh, through the eyes of Christ, which means sometimes the most, the best spiritual leadership or headship says, yeah, I was wrong. Or I don't, I don't know what to do. I need you to actually help me figure this out. Because I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Men and women are both called to be intelligent in their faith. Knowledgeable of Scripture and pursuing the best for each other in their decisions which they make together, right? If there's a situation where a woman doesn't have a voice and her needs and desires aren't being really taken into account, then this is a situation of abuse and non-Christian headship. Three, uh, submission and headship do not mean that you don't try to influence your husband, all right? 
Uh, I think sometimes it's assumed that like, oh, well, I, I, I met a woman a, a number of years ago, and uh, I sat down with her, and, um, and she said something to me along the lines of like, well, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to do this with, with, uh, with uh, teaching and stuff, but, uh, but I'm just a woman, and so I don't. And I kind of was like, what do you mean you're just a woman? Like, let's stop. Let's have a conversation about that. She felt like she didn't have a role. Um, and this is not with her husband, right? But she felt like she couldn't influence the, the, the Christian community she worked in because she was a woman. But, by the way, she's a missionary today. Uh, that changed for her drastically. But she had to wrestle with this idea of... of being a man or a woman doesn't mean you leave your ability to influence others behind. You need to be having those conversations. You need to be challenging yourself. You need to be challenging one another. And within relationship, men are imperfect, and this is no surprise, right? But love calls us to challenge one another. If you're a parent, you don't love your child by never challenging them to change. And quite, quite the opposite. Because you love your child, you're going to challenge them to change. And spouses should do this for each other too. I don't know if you're right there. What about this? Think about it this way, right? Because it's drawing one another on towards a, a more intelligent way of approaching the relationship. Uh, just quickly here, submission heads do not mean that a wife only gets her spiritual strength from her husband. Women need to be part of communities where they're being fed God's word, they need to be praying, they need to be engaged in others, they need to be sharing their faith with others, and uh, submission does not mean living in fear, right? If women ever find themselves in a situation where they're living in fear, they're not in a healthy, Christian, spiritual, uh, headship type of relationship. It's just, it's just not true because men are called to give up their lives for their wives. This needs to be this reciprocal type of living. And this ultimately is where we come down to in verses 11 and 12, which is, which is really what Paul's been moving towards this whole time. He said, nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born from woman. But everything is from God. This is the, the complementarian view, I think, right? We are equally made in the image of God with the same spirits and gifts and capabilities fueling each of us, and yet our roles are different as they are with God. This is a position of faith, right? Ultimately, it's a position of faith. Uh, I, know, I know women uh, who, are, who are in different roles in ministry, um, and, and I know that this is a hard teaching uh, for, for a lot of them, but this ultimately comes down to something that says, once again, it's, it's not because we believe men are more capable. It's really only a position of faith that says, I think this is what God's word says. I, I think I do. Humbly, this is what I think God's word says, and if it's true, I guess I need to wrestle with that, right? But the main theme of this passage seems to be deference in love for the sake of witness, both to one another and to others, right? So, so whether we're talking about what headgear or haircut you have in worship service on Sunday morning, or whether the way you're talking about how you love your husband or your wife, the way you live, the way you act, the way you present yourself to others says something about your hope, about your love, and ultimately about the truth of the gospel. Here's the truth, guys. The gospel is this, that Jesus loved each one of you so much, male and female, that he would die for you and come back, or come for you to this earth, die for you, and send the Holy Spirit so that he can live with you through all the struggle and all the trials and all the issues. And then he says he's coming back. And you're invited on with him. Onto eternal life. It isn't about being a man or a woman. It's not about being the right kind of man. It's about trusting that the death and resurrection of Christ is founded in a love for you that you can't earn that you can't stand up and demand your rights for, that you can't put down enough uh, other people enough to own 
You can't be so manly or so womanly that somehow you get God's love. You have it. You have God's love. And because you have it, it's an invitation to trust Him with the desire He's given you. With that, I want to I want to end in prayer here, and I want to go into a time of uh, a time of reflection and communion. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for your word, the challenge that it gives us. Lord, I pray that um, I'd get out of the way and 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 you would uh, step in, Lord. If there's things that are helpful today, then you'd help them to stick with the, these folks who are here today. If there's things that are not helpful, you'll just help them drift away. But Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be at work. On this group of people, helping us to understand what's a difficult topic for us to hear today in our cultural climate, but being able to understand the call to worship that you've given us, that extends from Paul's day all the way to ours, that we're called to live in love, out of hope, the hope you've purchased for us on the cross, and the hope we're about to celebrate now. We pray this in Jesus' name.